Despite being charged with one count of murder and two counts of premeditated murder and a gang-related killing, a white Southern California teen was released after jail after his wealthy parents posted a $5 million bail. Prosecutors say Terrell was a privileged teen who led a double life. They say he befriended South Los Angeles gang members and drove the getaway car. But he said he didn't know the teens he was with planned on shooting anyone. Oh, I talk to God every day and God knows all my sins. So I don't have to explain myself to anyone. God knows what really happened that day and God knows what was in my head that day. So We begin tonight with breaking news. A jury has reached a decision in the murder case against a former Rancho Palos Verdes High School student. The case made headlines when the teen admitted he was the getaway driver and got out on bail. CBS News' Juan Fernandez is live in our newsroom at this hour with the jury's verdict. Juan? Well, Jeff Crystal, the jury found Cameron Terrell not guilty of all counts in last year's deadly shooting in South Los Angeles. It is a blow to the prosecution who said despite his affluent background, Terrell ran around with known gang members. The story of how an 18-year-old White Palos Verde senior from an affluent family became embroiled in gang life with the notorious Rollin 90s Crips seems ripped from a Hollywood script. Yet this real-life tale of misguided obsession played out miles away from the glamorized fiction of the entertainment industry. Amidst the stark poverty and hardship of South Central Los Angeles, Cameron Terrell grew up surrounded by every advantage money could provide, from the imposing comfort of his family's lavish $2 million mansion to flashy cars granting status and privilege. Admission to California's top academic institutions paved any future he might desire with unlimited possibilities. Yet Terrell spurned this life of effort affluence, turning his back on trust funds and manicured ease for a shot at play acting as a genuine crip on some of LA's meanest streets. He dove obsessively into full gang cosplay, adopting styles and symbols of the fearsome Roland 90s, crafting a false persona balancing the gang member fantasy he indulged in the hood against the cushy reality awaiting back in his peaceful Palos Verdes paradise. But his reckless fetishization of thug life ultimately caught up with Terrell in a dramatic and tragic fashion that many observers took as a stern warning wrapped in a larger message about the hubris of appropriating trauma one hasn't earned in this video. We will examine how Cameron Terrell crossed the line from a wealthy suburb into the notoriously dangerous rolling 90s. We'll see how his actions led to tragic consequences for others when real blood was shed. This cautionary tale reveals what can happen when misguided youth treat gang affiliation as a costume to put on and take off. Cameron Terrell was said to have been affiliated with the rolling 90s neighborhood Crips, a faction within the broader Crips gang network, situated on the west side of South Los Angeles, California. California. Their territory spans from Van Ness Ave to Western Ave, encompassing the area between Manchester BLVD and Century BLVD, including Jesse Owens Park. There's speculation that the Rolling 90s neighborhood Crips originated from the Rolling 60s neighborhood Crips, maintaining the Rolling neighborhood Crips title. However, some suggest they emerged independently before allying with the Rolling 60s neighborhood Crips later on. This collaboration led to the fusion of the two groups, which has since extended to other gangs, such as the Rolling 40s neighborhood Crips. Together, they form the Neighborhood Crip Alliance. Despite shared names and affiliations, rivalry and violence can still erupt between sets within the Alliance. The Rolling 90s stake claim to Western Ave as their symbolic street. Members often wear apparel representing Western Ave or the logo of the Washington Nationals baseball team, which contains a prominent W, while Jesse Owens Park in their territory is another hangout and meeting place for the gang. The posh Palos Verdes Estates, home to Terrell's family, was a world away from the mean streets of South Central LA. As the only child of successful parents, Parents, Cameron grew up surrounded by wealth and privilege. He attended the exclusive Palos Verdes High School where he earned good grades and enjoyed a comfortable life. Yet fascination with the gang lifestyle would drive Terrell to abandon his cushy suburban existence. He became enthralled by gang culture, amassing books and music that romanticized the thrill and danger of that world. In 2016, simmering tensions at home led Terrell to start spending time at Jesse Owens Park in South Central. This notorious hotspot served as the main hangout for the feared Rollin 90s neighborhood Crips. There, Terrell met youths who would soon join the ranks of the gang. Through these new connections, the naive teenager from the suburbs was gradually drawn into the orbit of the gang. Terrell dove headfirst into full gang immersion. He adopted the street name Milk, or White Boy. The heir to affluence began giving his designer clothes away to fellow gang members. His prized Mercedes became a luxury ride for the whole set. By September 2017, barely a month before Justin Holmes's murder, Cameron Terrell had become a notorious mascot for the Roland 90s Crips. His elaborate gang persona attracted the attention of South Central rapper Chi 
Chico, who featured Terrell prominently in his Gang Allegiance anthem song, NH Anthem. Seen clad in the trademark blue bandana, Terrell openly postures alongside rolling 90s members, rapping along to lyrics. His carefree presence in the video encapsulates his romanticized view of gang life, with no conception of the violence to come. After footage of Terrell's dramatic fall from wealthy teen to wannabe gangbanger went viral following his eventual arrest, Street TV caught up with rapper Chico to get his take. But when questioned about Cameron's puzzling embrace of the gang as an outsider, and his reputation for hanging around Jesse Owens Park, the artist predictably declined any comment associating himself with these activities. But do you want to talk about how your, that video was all over the news a couple weeks ago and, and the, uh, the situation that led up to that? Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. And if you don't want to answer this next question, that's cool too. But people are going to ask me why I didn't ask. But it, it's known that there's a, a, a white dude that that hangs out in the neighborhood. Uh, how does that come about? A dude that not didn't grow up over here by Jesse Owens Park that ends up being affiliated. I don't know. Still, the music video stands as an eerie visual prelude to the fateful confrontation only weeks later. While Terrell enjoyed recklessly portraying the gang member in this world of fantasy, real lives were soon lost to senseless gang warfare. On the morning of October 1, 2017, 18-year-old Cameron Terrell embarked on a sinister mission under the guise of harmless teenage mischief. Despite claiming he only intended to spray paint rival gang territory, Terrell drove two fellow Rollin' 90s Crip members deep into enemy turf, cruising his father's black Mercedes to the 7,800 block of Southwestern Avenue in broad daylight. This area was the heart of their mortal enemy's domain, the eight tray gangster Crips. Bad blood brewed between these gangs for decades, ever since a fight over a girl in the 1970s caused local sets to choose sides. The Rollin 90s aligned with their partners, the Rollin 60s neighborhood Crips against the eight trays. So venturing into their area was practically begging for violence. As Terrell idled curbside in the luxury vehicle, his passengers took to the streets on what he supposedly thought was an innocent graffiti mission. However, their intentions were far more sinister. 21-year-old Justin Holmes was walking with friends when the gangsters confronted them, asking where they were from. Holmes's companions wisely fled as Holmes insisted he did not gang bang. Unsatisfied with this response, one assailant pulled a pistol and fired into Holmes at close range. The shooters sprinted back to their waiting getaway car and Terrell slammed the accelerator, tires screeching as they sped off. The whole crime was captured on surveillance cameras. L.A. paramedics rushed to the scene and transported Holmes to a nearby hospital. Despite desperate efforts, he succumbed to his wounds and was pronounced dead shortly thereafter. A mere 12 days after the senseless murder of Justin Holmes, officials arrested Cameron Terrell and his two underaged accomplices. Though Terrell claimed ignorance, he was charged with Holmes's premeditated murder, accused of knowingly driving his associates to kill that day. In a blatant display of special treatment exposing clear racial bias, privileged white teen Cameron Terrell secured pretrial release on an excessive $5 million bail, despite facing serious gang-related homicide charges. Meanwhile, his two co-defendants, black juveniles accused of the very same ruthless crimes, were peremptorily denied any bail whatsoever and held imprisoned in custody throughout the lengthy proceedings. Free on bond thanks solely to his family's vast financial resources, Terrell shamelessly resumed his carefree life of leisure and pleasure attending Dodger World Series games, while his abandoned companions remained caged like animals, initially permitted to return to the manicured grounds of his prestigious Palos Verdes High. Indignant parents soon protested, allowing this accused violent criminal to freely roam their community. I'm not thoroughly convinced that they have this under control. To have a, an adult who is charged with the worst crime possible being allowed to attend school with 3,000 kids it's not right, and I believe the education code supports his suspension. Alarmed about potential gang-related threats and retaliation targeting their own children over Terrell's activities, their vocal outrage helped pressure the school to remove him from campus. This stark contrast in treatment, based entirely on race and class, fueled intense public scrutiny over the overt injustice at play. But for privileged Cameron Terrell, the jaw-dropping preferential treatment shielding him from any real consequences had only just begun. Terrell's family tapped the skills of renowned defense attorney Joe Van Blacknell to represent Cameron. His flashy lawyer called over 20 character witnesses, who asserted Terrell seemed incapable of violence or murder. Prosecutors painted a starkly contrasting portrait, not of a wayward boy 
fascinated by the danger of gang lore, but rather of a privileged sociopath who brazenly murdered to gain status. They presented damning photos, social media posts, and the infamous footage of Terrell throwing signs in the NH Anthem video that tied him to the rolling 90s. Even more damning, police discovered a t-shirt scrawled with Terrell's alias, Milk in blue ink stashed in his car. Blacknell played down this evidence as mere posturing inspired by popular media, not reality. He claimed after a close friend joined the rolling 90s, Terrell became infatuated with gang culture, going on an L.A. gang binge, amassing literature on the lifestyle. His menacing social media personality was dismissed as fantasy roleplay, unrelated to the violent world of real gang warfare. Most crucially, Blacknell asserted that on the day of the murder, Terrell assumed they were only going to tag rival territory, nothing more. Allegedly, Cameron had no clue about the guns or any intent to shoot. At worst, claimed his lawyer, clueless Cameron merely bore witness to the crime. After nearly a week weighing these contrasting portraits, the jury stunned court observers, acquitting Terrell on all counts, rejecting charges he murdered to gain rank among the gang. In a post-verdict statement, Terrell had the sheer audacity to offer public condolences to the victim's family, claiming he prays for them nightly. To the grieving loved ones, these words rang appallingly hollow and false, only twisting the knife deeper into their anguish over their tragic loss and the lack of real justice. The improbable not guilty verdict confounded legal experts and gang affiliates alike. Veteran LA rapper Trey D, an admitted member of the Insane Crips, shared his insightful perspective in an interview. While Trey D expressed surprise at the outcome, he speculates Terrell benefited from top-notch legal representation that his wealth afforded him, resources clearly out of reach for most. This kid right here, who actually come, came from a, a rich family in Palos Verdes Estates in California, uh, he was 18-year-olds at the time, came from, like I said, a very rich family, went and joined the Roland 90s neighborhood Crips and used his dad's Mercedes <laughs> where they did a drive-by on someone who they thought was an enemy gang member who was actually a unaffiliated U-Haul worker and shot him dead. Damn. And he actually got acquitted. Did he? Yep. How'd that happen? So he, he posted a $5 million bond, mm -hmm. which means someone put up half a million dollars. Right, right. The teen's lawyer argued that wasn't aware that the other teens were planning to kill someone that day and that he thought he was going to go do some graffiti. He said, at best, evidence suggests that Cameron was a witness, and that's it. So he probably testified against all of them. Possibly. I don't think there's any possibly about it. <laughs> well, that was a good alibi. I mean, that was a good story, though. That was a good uh, justification. Hey, man, I thought we was just riding. We was going to tag something up. I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. But they say ignorance is no excuse for the law, but in that situation, how committed was he? You know what I mean? How much did he add a little? You, you know, money talk, man. If he, if he was able to bail out on a $5 million bond, he had a great lawyer. I can guarantee you that. Oh, yeah. Meanwhile, Cameron's juvenile co-defendants endured over a year of pretrial detention with no option for bail, likely due to racial bias as well as lack of means. They languished with only overworked, underpaid public defenders in their corner, not the expensive legal eagles who may have maneuvered a better outcome on their behalf. Justin Holmes's grieving family faced a painful a lifetime deprived of his stolen potential. The trial's appalling verdict left them bitterly aware that money, power, and racial prejudice, not truth or accountability, shaped the trial's outcome. To them, Terrell's hollow public condolences only further mocked the utter miscarriage of justice regarding Justin's senseless murder. Rest in peace, Justin Holmes. He should have died that day, and, you know, I pray for his family every night. This has been weighing on me every single day of my life, so. Since the other two charged in Justin Holmes's murder were juveniles at the time, the ultimate outcome of their case remains unknown. We can only speculate what might have happened to the black teens compared to rich white Cameron Terrell's full acquittal. One co-defendant's father spoke out about the blatant unfairness his son faced, as he told journalist Jasmine Kanick. My son going through hell, you know, in the juvenile system. He just turned 17, but he ain't there for a serious crime, you know, but I can't understand that how this other guy, because of a color thing and a color issue, he able to walk the streets and be freely able to go to school, go to baseball games. He not on no strict restrictions, not on no uh, monitor, don't have a house to break laid down his ankle or nothing. So basically, he was in the same case with my son and his other juvenile, but they still got the other two kids in there 
why he's free to roam the streets and do whatever you want to do. Activist and former Crip Melvin Farmer told CBS2 saying, two black juveniles are probably facing life sentence to where an adult took them to do something where he should have been held responsible just as much. Criminal justice professor Richard Kania also weighed in, stating that Terrell had the privilege of hiring a private defense attorney and that he just doesn't fit the image of a gangbanger. Their words encapsulate the thoughts shared by many following this case, that while Cameron Terrell regained his freedom, the fate of his young black co-defendants remains tragically uncertain. The odds that they would be extended the same grace as their privileged driver seem very slim. For them, Terrell's full acquittal likely signifies yet another instance of racial bias tainting the quest for justice. While Justin Holmes' loved ones and the families of the juveniles had no choice but to agonize over the lack of accountability, privileged Cameron Terrell swiftly dusted off his hands and resumed his charmed life. Terrell claimed the ordeal inspired him to study law himself and become a criminal defense attorney. He announced his intentions to attend the University of Houston. However, no evidence confirms Terrell actually matriculated there. Having scrubbed his social media presence, Terrell kept a low profile until another arrest in spring 2019 for an alleged armed carjacking dating back to when he was a minor. The surprise arrest conveniently interrupted his schooling over spring break. His tireless defender Blacknell insisted police were overreaching, unable to pin the previous murder charge on Terrell, so now grasping his straws to charge him with anything they could from his gang affiliations back then. When the homicide did not stick, they tried to find something else, complained Blacknell. Cops revealed evidence of Terrell's involvement and additional felonies had emerged during the homicide investigation, which could only now be brought as separate charges since the statutes of limitation had expired on bundling them together. Initially held without bail, within a month Terrell secured probation for the armed robbery and carjacking charges. When later queried, attorney Blacknell smoothly replied, the case has been resolved. Cameron is back home, planning to continue with his college education, albeit no longer at the University of Houston given this disruptive legal entanglement. Once again, Cameron Terrell appears to have eluded any real responsibility for past actions against others in the community. For him, the privileges of wealth and whiteness persist in erasing repercussions, while less fortunate peers continue bearing the dramatic brunt of an unjust system. Though in some karmic retribution, Holmes's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Terrell and his family, attempting to extract some sliver of accountability where the criminal justice system failed them. Still, no court ruling can return their stolen loved one, and nothing extracts the bitterness over witnessing blatant systemic bias and racial privilege, adding insult to deep injury. For those grieving Justin Holmes, true justice remains elusive. The tragic case of Cameron Terrell and the death of Justin Holmes stands as a sobering example of the potentially disastrous consequences when privileged youth recklessly dabble in the violence of street gangs. It also lays bare difficult truths about racial inequity embedded in the American justice system. While Terrell escaped responsibility for his role in the murder, his black teenage companions faced over a year locked up awaiting trial. The odds seemed stacked that, unlike their rich white friend, the juveniles would serve hard time regardless of their young age. Perhaps tellingly, the outcome in their case remains unknown to this day, and for the family of slain Justin Holmes, no just verdict could ever compensate for their profound loss or stem their grief. At only 21 years old, Holmes lost his life amidst senseless gang warfare sparked by outsiders invading a neighborhood he just happened to be visiting that morning. The tragic erasing of Justin's bright future dealt the harshest blow to those who loved him. His murder left a wound that no passage of time may fully heal. As observer Trey D. emphasized, money provided access to the excellent legal defense that likely tipped the scales of justice in Terrell's favor. Many feel that had his companions enjoyed similar robust representation, the trial's outcome may have differed greatly. Instead, racial inequity and poverty seemingly predetermined their fate behind bars. Terrell's full acquittal and rapid return to his tranquil, prosperous roots cast this case as a morality tale with no real justice or accountability. In an interview years later, South Central rapper Chico shared perspective that seems strikingly applicable to Cameron Terrell's story. When asked about people trying to join gangs in their mid-twenties, Chico dismissed them as working backward. His words could easily describe Terrell's own naive gang obsession. This ain't no to get into at the age of 25. The goal is, is to get money and to make it out the hood. I don't want to be in the hood all this life. Yeah. So you you want to get put on at 25 to come what, hang around a bunch of like us? Yeah. You don't even know us. We'll rob you. We'll yeah. kill you. They, they work backwards. Like those desperate late joining wannabes Chico derides, privileged teen Cameron Terrell became fatally enamored of the gangsta lifestyle popularized in music and media. Despite enjoying every advantage, he fetishized the danger and violence of the streets. 
Terrell proved willing to abandon comfort and security to posture as a real gang member with the ruthless rolling 90s Crips. But his immersion in brutal gang culture led him down a dark path to murder. And while Terrell largely evaded repercussions thanks to wealth and whiteness, playing gangsta games carried very real consequences for others lacking his privilege. Chico's words underline the key lesson of Cameron Terrell's cautionary tale. Gang life is a dead-end street, leading only to prison or the grave. For those working backward chasing fleeting thrills through violence and crime, the ending inevitably proves tragic if they survive long enough to see it. If you found insight or value in this cautionary true tale, be sure to like, subscribe, and leave your thoughts in the comments below. Let's keep the conversation going and continue uplifting each other.